right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is JR. I am the, the CTO at Twilio Syngrid. Here to talk to you a little bit today about uh, our experiences, our migration to the cloud. It started with re-architecting, um, and it quickly became uh, re-architecting virtually everything. So I'm going to go at a, a pretty quick pace, dense stack, so we'll get to work. Just a few slides really quick, uh, kind of an introduction about just kind of give, get your head wrapped around the, the issue. Uh, Twilio Syngrid has two main components. We have a, an API-driven email product, which uh, is the bulk and the original use case. Kind of the canonical example for that would be what we would call transactional emails. Uh, this would be from, like as an example, if you take an Uber, by the time you get out of the car and you, you grab the handle of the building that you're walking into, you typically feel that buzz in your pocket. That's because that receipt email is being routed through the Twilio uh, Syngrid email infrastructure. So that is kind of that main product. We have a second uh, newer product suite, which is based on marketing. Uh, so the first product built for developers, by developers, API driven for the most part. Second product, uh, really envisioning a persona for a marketing person. Just really quick, some of the top level metrics, uh, just to give you a sense of the scale that we're talking about here. Um, 50 billion, north of 50 billion emails a month. Any given day, we're sending well, well north of a billion. Uh, big numbers, kind of sort of abstract, esoteric. I think the one that really resonates with me is in any given 90-day period, Syngrid has sent an email to roughly half the email users on planet Earth. It gives you kind of a sense of the reach that we're looking at. And then just kind of some of the, some of the companies that uh, are Twilio Syngrid customers. So when we examined the space, uh, what we really saw was three kind of underlying issues. Uh, when I joined Twilio Syngrid four years ago, the initial architecture has scaled from zero to over a billion emails a day, pretty remarkable, but it was starting to show signs of strain. Uh, we, we knew that we would be managing uh, stuff on-prem uh, for the, the short time thereafter, but ultimately we were gonna be doing a migration uh, up to Amazon. Uh, Syngrid had used cloud services sort of ancillary, um, but really we, we had decided that we were gonna shift the main part of our business up into Amazon and ultimately we're gonna have all of it up there. And then this created a little bit of a problem. Email is a uh, fairly old antiquated technology. It's been around obviously for many years. It predates the modern notion of the cloud. And so there's certain assumptions in the architecture, it's both the, the systems and the software architecture, they're not very good fits for the cloud. So what we realized we needed to do was spend some time re-architecting things to get things ready to, to shift up to Amazon. And that's where we spend most of our time today. So looking at the space, we can see uh, the limitations that we're really dealing with kind of on the left and ultimately our solutions that we came up with are on the right. So we'll be talking through these kind of uh, through the remainder of these slides. I just wanted to present this first uh, to just kind of give you a sense of where we're gonna be going from here. So uh, we'll, we'll look at this in two different slices. The first one we can think of as a systems architecture, the, the kind of the changes that we made there. And then uh, after that, I'll talk about uh, changes we made at the software architecture level, uh, lessons we learned along the way, and things that we think might be helpful for you. So at this systems architecture level, there's really, uh, we're attacking these two, uh, these top two limitations, the unbounded failure domains, and uh, sort of a very nuanced problem called width thrashing. So the initial architecture that Syngrid had uh, was you could think of it as a scale up architecture. So lots of monolithic components, not one big monolith, but a bunch of monolithic components all designed to work together uh, as the company grows, uh, we have more customers that we take on or those customers get bigger. We, we have kind of what you could think of as a scale up architecture. The monolithic components are scaling up, uh, major parts of the pipeline are scaling up. And this leads to uh, problems. Uh, specifically, this means we have an unbounded failure domain. The more emails that we are sending, the more customers that we onboard, uh, the, the problem is unbounded. As, as successful as the business gets, that is the blast radius if we have a cascading failure, which we were at systemic risk for. So, you know, at, at the highest level, the, the shift that we made here was, was shifting to more of a scale-out architecture, not just the scale-out components. We'll get to that again in a minute. But this is really imagining, reimagining the email pipeline as sets of mail pipelines versus one big pipeline that we send a bunch of traffic into. The obvious side effect of this is that you now have uh, a bounded failure domain and, and then we can actually set what that domain is and, and uh, 
what makes the most sense for Twilio Syngrid's customers, what makes the most sense for the business. The analogy I use here often is, uh, you know, if you think about submarines or, or boats, you have bulkheads that separate the components, right? So really what you're trying to do is, is make sure you have a bounded failure domain such that, you know, if you start taking on water, the whole ship doesn't sink. It's kind of an isolated problem. Obviously, we do everything that we can uh, do to, to keep our five nines of uptime, keep the mail flowing. Problems happen at scale. I think uh, given enough scale, failure is imminent. Um, so this one, I think, pretty self-evident, but I can, I can uh, double-click on this and really talk about a, a specific problem that this creates to us, not just at the risk and failure domain level, but actually uh, limitations with this particular system. So at the end of this mail pipeline, you have a set of MTA processes. These MTAs are ultimately the last hop from the Twilio Syngrid infrastructure to the ISP or, or whoever's going to be receiving the email that we're trying to send out. The way that that mail gets queued is at the sender and the recipient domain. So I think uh, the illustration I have here, the users, uh, Ann, Andy, uh, and they are sending to different domains. I think I've selected AOL and Gmail here. So in this case, uh, Ann has two different queues, uh, one for the email that she's sending to AOL.com and the other for the email that she's sending to Gmail.com. And the MTAs are constantly making decisions about how to optimize the egress or the outflow out from the system. So this is uh, typically a process where the MTA does some work, grabs, uh, you know, expedites and, and dispatches that email, and then ultimately goes back and figures out what it is going to do next. It was doing that uh, locally uh, in a VM within its own uh, queue. It's actually using what's called a heap mechanism for that. So uh, you can think of the queues, the width of the queues as how many, if, if you're thinking about it, even as like a, a spreadsheet, each column would represent uh, a given user. Uh, that would be a, a Twilio Syngrid customer. And then the recipient domains that they have in queue to send to. So you could think of each one of those as a column, sender plus recipient domain. The depth of that column is how many emails that we currently have queued up from that sender to that domain. The MTAs are very, very good at ripping through those. And this makes sense if you think through it. You establish a TCP connection. Uh, once all that overhead is done, it's, it's generally pretty efficient to get email through the system. What happens, though, is as the width of the queues grows wider, the MTA starts spending more and more time thinking about what it needs to do next versus actually doing work, right? And eventually, this will put it in a death spiral. So these queues will disappear. They're transient in nature. Obviously, we don't persist these queues forever um, in memory. But uh, so as we dispatch, in this case, all of Andy's email headed to AOL.com, that queue disappears. That makes sense. But in this scenario that I was mentioning, in this, this infinite scale up, this, this puts an increasing amount of pressure, memory pressure, on those MTAs. So we literally can get to a spot at, uh, with unbounded growth that the MTAs li literally spend more time trying to, to figure out what is the most efficient next thing for it to do than actually doing the work. And if it gets far enough along in that process where uh, the queues are wide enough that it's examining all of these to figure out what's the most efficient path, if it's spending a percentage of its time doing that instead of actually doing the work to dispatch those queues, it will actually put it in a death spiral where it gets worse and worse and worse. So this is at the, the software level where we start to run into some pretty real problems with this unbounded width issue. So again, what we've chosen, chosen to do here is fix the width using different mail pipelines. That constrains how many uh, different tuples of recipient uh, center and recipient domains that an MTA is ever going to have to deal with. It makes the system substantially more um, efficient. Which, which ultimately is the problem that we're trying to deal with here. Uh, Twilio Syngrid, we make our living optimizing and making sure that email gets into the inboxes, wanted email gets into the inboxes. We can't control our rate of ingress, the rate at which our customers are sending us mail. Uh, we, we always have more customers each day is effectively a new high water day for us. Similarly, we can't actually control all of the egress. There is a, a huge amount of email providers on the planet or inbox providers, and they all operate at different kind of uh, capacities, thresholds, uh, response to uh, email from us differently. So really, you can almost think of the, the job that we have to do is create a, a big clutch, right, is to, to have this buffer between this constant inflow of email and figuring out how to dispatch it as quickly as possible. 
So ultimately, we end up in a scenario where we can optimize the width of what we, we see in normal run rate for these MTAs such that they're operating very efficiently. It makes a ton of sense. You don't want to actually go super narrow here um, because there's a lot of overhead in the MTA creating a new connection to uh, an inbox provider. Um, so there is definitely a sweet spot that we're looking for here, and that's what we configure the software for. So that's, that's kind of the first uh, look at the systems level now. If we kind of double click even further, we can look into the software architecture. Um, and this is where it gets a little bit more meaty. So in this, in this section, we're really dealing with uh, these last four challenges that we saw. Um, the storage that email uses typically is uh, the spool folder on uh, a single machine. That's obviously uh, fault intolerant. If that node goes away, that email goes away. Um, the other problem that you have here is that the email RFCs uh, suggest that you retry to send an email for a period of time, four or five days. And so if that inbox isn't available for some reason, there's a, a back off that we're doing. But the, the issue that you really deal with here is when we get a flood of email in a normal cloud scenario, you would expect to be able to auto scale up your compute. The issue for us is in a, in a classic email architecture, that compute is stateful and specifically stateful with the email that it has. So that causes a durability issue uh, in the case of a VM. But that also means I needed the compute for five minutes to do the processing. Now I've got to leave that compute sitting around for three or four days while it DQs all the email that it's having trouble getting to certain providers, like inbox full, if you guys remember those from days past. Tight coupling, uh, the architecture uh, had tight coupling between the mail processors and the MTAs. Uh, I mentioned that those MTAs get more efficient at just the sweet spot of the width they need to deal with. Uh, the way that the email typically or, or historically worked is the mail processor and the MTA are coupled. They're, they're expecting to be sharing uh, a local spool folder. So the processor spits out into that spool folder, the MTA picks it up. That tight coupling causes an issue for us. Uh, and then the, the way that the original architecture worked uh, was also prone to hot spotting. Uh, essentially, you have uh, at first hardware and then later on we had software load balancers at the front of these mail pipelines. It's, it's effectively working on a least connections algorithm, which is not necessarily representative of how much actual work uh, a given machine is doing. All right, so legacy approach, I just described a little bit of this. Uh, from our recipients, uh, our customers, you have load balancers on the front of uh, what was a physical boundary in a data center. And then you have server boundaries of the mail processors. Um, this is leveraging local disk. This requires both the, uh, the mail processor and the mail sender or the MTA to actually be able to read the same POSIX file system. So typically that's done on the same machine. With this new approach, we've changed a whole lot of stuff. We've removed the state that, that occurs on both the MTAs and the mail processors. We've fixed uh, the durability concerns by using object storage. Uh, and then we've decentralized all of the queuing mechanisms that are required. And we'll walk through these one by one. So first up was the durable storage. As I mentioned, uh, email typically works by writing to a local spool. Um, regardless of what compute you're using, um, even in the data centers, that's putting you in a, in a position where you're, you are not very fault tolerant. Servers die all the time. If you have enough of them, uh, undoubtedly, that is going to occur to you. Um, at that point in time, that's, if that's the only place that you persist that email, we've dropped the ball on behalf of our customers. If those are password resets, if uh, those are, are very time sensitive emails, that is a big deal for both our customers and our customers' customers. Obviously, that's a situation we want to try and avoid. So by switching from local storage to uh, a cloud-based object store, what we've done is pulled that out and added durability. So on-premise, we're using uh, a technology called Ceph for that. It looks a whole lot like S3. In Amazon, we'll probably be using a blending of technologies to solve this problem for various performance and cost reasons. So that's kind of step one. Step two, uh, what this allows us to do is once we pull the email off of the actual compute nodes, we now have the ability to have ephemeral compute. So again, classically, you have these nodes, they spin up, they're grabbing email, and they may have to hold on to that email and attempt to retry to send that email for up to uh, 72, 96 hours, something like that. 
If we pull that email off of that server, we can spin up compute uh, elastically as needed, and then we can spin it back down when we don't need it, and we don't have any durability issues in doing that. Thirdly, this allows us to indep independently scale where we need it. So I alluded to the fact that uh, in the original architecture, the, there was tight coupling between the mail processor and the MTAs. So typically where we would see it is when we have a burst of traffic, you would have a, a dire need to have more processing power on the mail processors. Um, interestingly though, so every time we would spin up more mail processors, we would inherently be creating more MTAs. This actually creates an interesting uh, problem at the egress for the, for the MTAs. Again, there's a sweet spot where they become actually inefficient if we create way too many of them. Um, there's a sweet spot in the middle. So by, by leveraging a storage mechanism, uh, object storage that was independent of both the mail processor and the MTAs, obviously those no longer need to live on the same initially VM. Ultimately, those will be in containers. This allows us to independently scale them and take advantages of what we expect to see in Amazon. In the original architecture, it was prone to hotspots because it was a push-based architecture. Again, I mentioned a least connections algorithm from the load balancer. So as traffic comes in from the edges, the load balancer is just simply dispatching that to the physical server or, or the, the VM that had the least amount of connections. Uh, each API call can potentially have a thousand emails as the recipient. So if it was a marketing type email, that might have kind of the body of the email with some placeholders for you know, you know, dear dollar sign user instead of dear dollar sign Dave, something like that. And uh, our customers will give us a map basically between what variables need to be replaced and what don't. Um, so you can you have a, a pretty tremendous fan out. One API call might result in a thousand emails. So you can immediately see least connections algorithm doesn't necessarily mean anything um, in terms of how much work or how backed up a given part of the system is. If one of those just through random distribution happens to have either uh, a disproportionate amount of load or is having difficulties in egress uh, dealing with uh, inbox providers that are, are operating slow or offline or having connection issues to, obviously you can imagine that these cause hotspots. That's, that's problematic because that's inefficient in the system. This means some email can get through the system fast, other email might be stuck for a long period of time. We're trying to avoid that. So what we've done is, is shifted from a push base to a pull base model, right? In, in which uh, when the mail processor is ready to do more work, it reaches out and says, hey, I'm ready to do more work. Uh, the same is true for the MTAs. This makes the system substantially more efficient. And again, you can imagine how these things play very nicely. Um, in a cloud environment such as Amazon. So a few quick conclusions. Uh, in summary, we realized that we needed to completely and fundamentally uh, re-architect things from the ground up uh, in, in order to make sense of a, a migration to the cloud. We were trying to fix some scaling issues that we're seeing in the original system simultaneously. Uh, we realized that we had to make changes sort of systemically, and this is always a tricky business. You've all heard the analogies about replacing uh, an engine while the plane is in flight. Very real scenario for us. We have, to <clears throat> we have to do this in parallel while we're sending billions of emails a day. So this was delicate work, trying to slot this in very carefully. We've, uh, we've tried to find ways in which we can incrementally provide value in so doing and avoid the big bang. We, we were not on premise on a Tuesday and in Amazon on a Wednesday. We're being very thoughtful of how we're going about doing this. So at this stage, we've, we've completed the re-architecture, which was a lot of development, uh, a lot of careful deployment, um, and we've done all of this on premise. And then the next major step for Twilio Syngrid is gonna be to now take this cloud architecture and move it from our co-located data centers up into Amazon. So some things that we learned along the way that I think are meaningful. I talk about an ideology in this first, in this first slide. What we discovered initially is that de depending on who I spoke to in the business, we were in agreement we wanted to go to Amazon, but, but people had different motivations for doing that. Different officers in the company had different things they were after. Uh, the CFO wanted to improve margins, right? The CISO wants to improve security. 
the head of product, uh, head of engineering want to improve velocity. Sometimes these are competing. Uh, it, is, it is difficult for me to both optimize for cost and optimize for velocity. A very simple example of that might be uh, optimizing for cost might be uh, very sparsely using uh, and very carefully using reserved instances, uh, rolling overlay technologies on top of EC2 that you have on reserved instances. That's going to require careful engineering to make that work. You know, alternately, you can hit the kind of the turbo go fast button and use more of the managed services. These are at odds. They, they are somewhat mutually exclusive. So getting a sense for what does success look like? What are you trying to accomplish? Uh, being deliberate and explicit with the different stakeholders and calling out when you see these inconsistencies. I talk about parameters to constrain the architectural decisions. What I mean by this is there, there were certain rules that we, we certainly could not uh, pass. So as an example, I mean, obviously, I, I cannot create the, a cost to serve that is higher than what we charge our customers, right? That's a pretty simple one to understand. Um, you can continue to refine that process, which makes this a little bit easier, especially if you're dealing with a, uh, a legacy um, software architecture, systems architecture, something that's been around 20, 30 years, trying to find a way to meaningfully move that to the cloud. You're going to need to do some work on this front. Um, there's going to be a lot of possibilities that you can consider. And to avoid paralysis analysis, anything you can do up front in the design phase to help constrain where you're trying to, to uh, make these changes is helpful. Uh, reconciling opposing considerations, again, this is all about ensuring that when you notice these conflicting drivers, that we have conversations about this. Not everyone gets their cupcake, right? Or maybe we, we, uh, everyone gets half a cupcake. But those are things that, that we need to be explicit about so we can get to the successful outcomes for the business. More changes may be required than you anticipate once you start looking at this. That was certainly the case for us, kind of like pulling a thread on uh, a sweater. Uh, pretty soon, I've got no sweater and a giant pile of thread. Um, that's, that's more or less what we found here. We thought that maybe we could make a, a couple tactical changes. And as we examined what was going to be necessary from a technological perspective and synthesizing that with what the business was trying to achieve, we realized we were going to have to make some pretty sweeping changes. Uh, transition plans matter. Uh, I am, uh, Syngrid is, is based in Denver. There's the mountains there. Uh, you guys have mountains here also. Um, if you notice, the trails don't go straight up the mountain, right? That would be the, the shortest path. That's not the quickest path. That's not the most sustainable path. We need to find ways to iterate to not just reduce risk for the customers and, and for the business, but also to be able to uh, learn along the way. This is why we, we are using the Agile SDLC. Um, we, we don't believe that we have crystal balls and we can get everything right up front. So what we're trying to do is decompose this into a set of changes and really trying to tighten up this build, measure, learn cycle. So we, we come up with a hypothesis. We have kind of a, a basic plan. Uh, and then we start to roll that out and we stop, measure, uh, learn, and see what we need to do to pivot along the way. And finally, uh, I've been to a lot of these talks where there's a lot of debate about this lift and shift versus cloud native. Uh, in our case, the, most, the majority of this stuff is going to end up being re-architected first versus lift and shift. I found that to be a false dichotomy, though. It, it entirely depends on business drivers. And as an example, I can tell you, uh, if you can gain uh, extra throughput from engineering from doing a lift and shift, and that comes at, a, at a initially an upfront uh, expense uplift, meaning it, it is more expensive for you in the short term, but you have more velocity from engineering or more cycles, more throughput, if you're burning less uh, in terms of non-differentiated heavy lifting, that might be a meaningful outcome for the business. You'll just go ahead and, and take the uh, sub-optimized cost for a short period of time, which gives you the uh, throughput to then go fix that, clean up the costs, and continue to accelerate the business. So those are the, the uh, major lessons we learned along the way. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, we've got a couple minutes for questions, if anyone has them. Great. Thanks, JR. Any questions? I can run around and use the mic. So, so who won the uh, internal debate on priorities? Was it, can we assume it was the CEO? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, of course the, the CEO always ends up winning, right? Um, there, there's ways to satisfy both, uh, kind of reduce costs, uh, protect the margins, also improve the velocity of engineering. So I think everyone was happy with the outcome in the end. It really ended up, instead of uh, this versus that, it was really shifting when certain things are going to occur. So specifically, 
Um, cost savings as an example. If we had a hard line that we were trying to uh, keep to there, we might do some additional engineering effort first to optimize for costs before we move things up into Amazon. Um, Twilio Singer was already extremely efficient in its data centers, uh, which is not necessarily very common. Um, in this case, we've, we've made choices as an example to get stuff out to our customers first, and then we'll circle back uh, and optimize for costs later. Yeah. Kind of a two-part question. Have you completed your transition over yet? And, and you know, if not, how much longer do you think you're going to be in that transition zone? And what about your data centers? What happens to them? <laughs> uh, good, good question. So have we completed the migration yet? No is the answer. Um, the major bulk of the mail pipelines are still on-premise for Twilio Syngrid. We've been building for the last couple of years uh, new features. Uh, new products are all up in Amazon. We continue to port some of the ancillary and auxiliary services up there. Uh, the major lifting is still on-prem. Uh, Syngrid was a standalone company. We were acquired by Twilio last year. That is uh, last year, and, and that was finalized, I think, in February of this year. So we're working out what makes the most sense. We need to now, you know, Syngrid had, had a specific goal in mind with when we would be out of our data centers. Now we need to reevaluate what, what makes the most sense for our new parent company, which is Twilio, um, and, and balance those two things. So I don't have a tight timeline for you yet. And then what happens to our data centers? Uh, these were all co-located data centers that we had contracts on. So we were originally, we had, we had tried to line up all of the leases on our servers and data centers and uh, ISPs all to try and you know, tie a nice bow on it on the end. Um, we might have to untie that and, and rejigger some things. So yeah, that, that's going to be a fun experience down the road for sure. Great questions. Kind of moving a process to cloud is one story, but actually moving data is another story too. Sometimes because you have two different uh, systems running on on premise and cloud, sometimes move or you need to replicate data. How do you actually manage the synchronize? Sometimes you need to have two set of the data at the mm -hmm. same time synchronized. Do you have any kind of particular paradigm or architecture design <laughs> to handle that? Yeah, uh, the TLDR is carefully, uh, is how you migrate the data. Um, the, the, the predominant issue for us at Twilio Syngrid is that uh, the initial data architecture, uh, I use the term dogpile data architecture, this is pretty common. Uh, you'll see this in companies that's growing super fast. You end up with one logical database uh, or data server that all the databases live in uh, that, that might sound familiar to you. Where this becomes a problem is uh, there is implicit, um, there's implicit paradigms in the software about the response times that they're going to get. So uh, the, these may not be things that are very well understood. Within a data center, within a co-located data center, we could expect probably two to four milliseconds of latency, something like that, uh, just on network traffic, right? If you, if you subtract all the overhead of the data store, you might be adding, you know, even, even if you're in the same you know, physical city as the Amazon region that you're going to, that might look something more like 30, 40, 50 milliseconds. That can be very meaningful. Um, it's easy enough for us to, uh, you know, have, the, the masters in one place and the, the secondaries either in Amazon or in the data center, one or the other. Where this becomes a problem is we have multiple parts of the application, multiple applications, all trying to talk to the same data store. And some of them are write latency intolerant. Meaning that, like, again, we can always put read replicas anywhere close enough to where the processes are happening. Spots where you have write latency intolerance becomes really thorny. So if I have multiple applications that all cannot tolerate very much write latency specifically, um, I'm going to either have to move them all at once from one to the other, from on-prem up to the cloud all at once in a big bang approach, or spend the time to tease those apart. Where this typically becomes a problem is where the applications are doing joins on the data. They're making certain assumptions about the, the data all coexisting in the same spot, and they're, they're really offloading some of that work on the uh, relational database server to do those joins. Um, if those are in two different data sources, you might have to move some of that work into the application sphere. So that's, that's the name of the game there, is understanding where your write latency insensitivity is. That's, that's been our experience anyway. Yeah. 